I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and welcome to Thursdays at 4. And uh, I just want to make a couple of announcements before we get going. And uh, I have my high-tech announcement maker here. So for those of you who are interested, on, um, on Monday there will be a University of Minnesota premiere of a new documentary called Ellis with Robert De Niro and the artist J.R. Uh, that's Ellis Island, a room in the Ellis Island complex you see behind you, and uh, JR's, some of JR's artwork along the floor. And uh, this new documentary will be shown in Elmer Anderson Library on the West Bank. The time is from 11.30 to 1 on Monday, and because a light lunch is included, be sure to RSVP, and you can RSVP from the Immigration History Re Research Center website, and um, the documentary itself is only about 15 minutes long, and then there will be a, a panel discussion uh, on immigration past, present, and future. Uh, there's another event that I didn't create a slide for, I forgot. On Tuesday, the, Envi the IAS Environmental Humanities Collaborative is sponsoring a talk here in this room, Tuesday afternoon, November 10th, from 2.30 to 4. And it, the speaker is Stephanie Le Ménager from the, uh, from the University of Oregon, and she'll be talking about Thinking the Anthropocene with Oil and Water, and you can find more information about this on the IAS website. And in case you're interested in being on the IAS web uh, listserv and you're not already, just send an email to ias at umn.edu. All right. Uh, next week, um, we have a uh, special Thursdays at 4 on what does the 21st century engaged public research university look like here at the University of Minnesota. And if this looks like a kind of crazy uh, slide, it might even be crazier. We're going to try to have a whole bunch of people present four minutes each using kind of Pecha Kucha slide uh, presentations. So, uh, and what it will really do is allow you to see different kinds of community-engaged scholarship across disciplines at the university, from uh, food and agriculture and design to the humanities, uh, education, social work, and medicine, among, among others. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce the introducer and to also thank the co-sponsors of today's event, which is and the co-sponsors are the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Global Change and the Departments of Music and African American and African Studies. And so the introducer is Michael Galopi, who is a IAS fellow this semester. And today's speaker, Louise Meinkies, is his uh, request, someone whose work that he finds inspirational <coughs> and stimulating. And so he gets to introduce uh, Professor Mikey. But um, uh, Michael is an assistant professor in the Department of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature here at Minnesota. And his research focuses on 20th century music, continental philosophy, critical theory, popular culture, and music of the African diaspora. And he previously taught at NYU, where he completed his PhD in historical musicology, and also he was at the University of Chicago, where he was a Harper Schmidt Fellow at the Society of Fellows from 2011 to 2013. We also know him here at the IAS as somebody who can play all night in a band, because he did that for Northern Spark. He had the, they, his band had the place jumping. So uh, without further ado, Michael. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, again, many thanks to our co-sponsors, the School of Music, African American and African Studies, um, and the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study for Global Change. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Louise Menkees, who comes to us today from Durham, North Carolina, where she's Associate Professor of Cultural Anthropology and Music at Duke University. Professor Menkees is a famed anthropologist of music and sound, working at the cutting edge of music, sound studies, and the politics of mediation 
as well as the linkages of music and conflict, music and violence, and the tremendously complex networks of meaning that occur in current day intercultural zones of creativity. Concretely speaking, or traditionally speaking, she's a specialist of Zulu music and dance, as well as the broader spheres of music, dance, sound, and culture in South Africa. Her background and academic expertise is interdisciplinary. She has an undergraduate degree and master's degree in music. Her PhD is in the field of anthropology from UT Austin. Her first book, entitled Sound of Africa, Making Music Zulu in a South African Studio, which she published at Duke University Press in 2003, was a groundbreaking ethnography, famed for its detailed attention to a recording studio as a mediator in Johannesburg in the early 1990s. And specifically, I'm looking at this recording studio as a complex nexus of poetics and collaboration. Her article, Shoot the Sergeant, Shatter the Mountain, the Production of Masculinity in Zulu and Goma Song and Dance in Post-Apartheid South Africa, received the 2005 Jap Kunst Prize for Most Significant Article in Ethnomusicology. In 2007, she was the recipient of a highly coveted fellowship from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Frederick Burkhardt Fellowship for Recently Tenured Scholars. In 2010, she all co-authored a series of significant articles with three collaborators in the fields of music and anthropology, Tom Porcello, Ana Maria Ochoa, and David Samuels, for the Annual Review of Anthropology. In 2012, and I actually remember the writing of those articles because I was in NYU at the time, I remember them <laughs> Skyping with you. In 2012, her thick description of the studio interface as a cosmic machine was included in Jonathan Stern's Sound Studies Reader, which Professor Gopanath and I are both teaching in the Sound Studies course. Uh, a piece that, with vividness and panache, emphasizes the complex network of affordances and imaginary spaces projected by the potentiality of the recording studio as a technology. Today, Professor Menkes will speak about material that is part of a new book project on Zulu music and dance. Her talk asks us what happens when artists refute music as a political act, yet by force of circumstance are embroiled in political violence, when masculine bravado that produces eloquent art at once can fuel conflict. As she details, these questions collide in South Africa today with performing and recording Zulu music challenges, uh, performing and recording Zulu music challenges our understanding of the organization of the sensory world. And thus, accordingly, her talk is entitled The Reorganizing of the Sensory World, Violence, Politics, Zulu Song During South Africa's Transition. Please give a warm welcome to Louise Mendes. Over melody, sound over logos, uh, 
um, and of course body of the mind. And that kind of uh, framing of African men's bodies historically has been crucial to the possibilities of, their, uh, of thereby um, enacting brutal control over those bodies in nation building and in entrepreneurial projects. So um, my project in a way around Zulu and Goma song and dance looks at the legacy of um, uh, the sort of uh, um, brutal control of African men's bodies with its twinned and double-edged uh, celebration of performed ferocity. So, uh, as an ethnomusicologist uh, interested in ethnography and aesthetics, I'm going to jump straight into an ethnographic moment about aesthetics and then uh, hopefully build, build out from that a little bit. And so, um, this is my starting point to think about this relationship between aesthetics and violent politics, and that is what to make of violent lyrics when they become a groove. So uh, I need to give you a little bit of background about Ngoma to get you uh, uh, to the sound example. And that is, it's a competitive men's uh, recreational form, high prestige men's recreational form. Uh, it grew out of migrant labor through the 20th century. Uh, it's performed in, um, in the cities, in, in, uh, around these men's hostels, decrepit men's hostels, that were a cornerstone of apartheid uh, and where uh, single men moved to the cities to come and live and find work. And it's also performed at homecoming times uh, in rural KwaZulu Natal, where these men, uh, uh, which, which these men call their home. Okay. So. This is a rural KwaZulu Natal where the team that I work with uh, live. On the left hand side, uh, the map of South Africa, the red is uh, the province of KwaZulu Natal, previously Natal. The red on the right is Msinga, um, which is the area in which these, this particular team comes from, so in the middle of the area. In Johannesburg, uh, they live uh, in the in sort of industrial period on the edges of the city, city centre uh, in uh, these men's hostels, such as this one. And in Goma, there, uh, there are lots of there are various styles of Goma. In fact, you could talk about an Goma belt in a way, going all the way from South Africa up, up the coast, uh, uh, the east coast of Africa, all the way up to. Um, uh, Malawi, Uganda, Kenya, uh, and um, in all of these places, there's a, there's a, there's the kind of commonality is perhaps a sort of com competitive group song and dance um, with singing, clapping, and um, some improvised dance, some choreographed dance, and in the Zulu case, also uh, a, a marching bass drum. So the style that I'm focusing on is one of the Zulu styles, it's called Mzanzi and Goma, and that particular style is the most prototypic sort of warrior um, Goma style. So in this um, moment that I'm bringing you to, in this Ngoma, song prepares and follows dancing. And the dancing, it prepares dancers for individual um, alternation of improvised dance sequences. And that's sort of the core part of this uh, dancing. So the idea of the song is the song has to stoke the dance team and provoke individuals to compete in these uh, solo displays against their peers. So, um, so here you are. This is dancer one, for example. There's dancer two. Dancer one, dancer two, dancer one, 
样子去。So here you see Zabiwa Makanya, who is the lead.、Um, and at the beginning of this track that I'm going to play for you, you will hear that a lot of agitated dancers, and they are all interjecting. A number of them, you'll hear them interjecting his dance name, which is too cool,、um, making、uh, music through this exclamation. And why it's too cool is because he's so strong. He's as strong as two drags on a joint. <laughs> <laughs> so what、uh, Zabiwe's job is is to string together different song fragments and to do it artfully to create a new whole. So here, as always, he begins with his signature song fragment,、um, and it's a fragment that really、uh, showcases his ringing voice. It's like a signature. So it's less about what the content of the song fragment is than it is about how he announces himself and is able to command the space. And then after that, he goes into all sorts of other、uh, song fragments. In this particular excerpt that you're going to hear, the performance is interrupted by some elders that、uh, need to settle the matter. So I'm going to fade that out and then fade it back in as the performance continues. When it fades back in, you'll hear Zabiwa stringing together. Three different song, song fragments, and he's doing this to get a groove going. So、um, you'll listen as you hear as he sings. As he gets a groove going, then you'll, you'll hear dancers beginning to clap. Then you'll hear a drum coming in, and then、um, the that sort of once that's all going, then dancers jump out to compete in the gym. So that's what you that's what you're listening to.、Here. Beginning. 
into a dancer's, uh, the, the dancers starting to dance against each other. So I recorded this in 1991 at a time when struggles on the ground were being articulated in terms of ethnic difference and migrants' men's hostels in rural KwaZulu Natal were hotbeds of activity. Remarks on current violence are inserted into the stream of a narrative in the course of building an aesthetic form. They include the poetic ambiguity of whether the singers, who are in fact Zulus, whether they include themselves as Zulus who are participating in the shooting or not. And these lyrics, Zulus are shooting, Kosas are shooting, Amabata are shooting, also certainly reproduce the ethnically divisive categories produced and fueled by the apartheid state. Referential and formal Referential and formal processes are at work at once. Zabiwe's primary task is to rev up, rev up the dancers so that they'll rush out to take the floor and then defend it with their artistry. He has to work the form till it topples over into a dance groove. And he does this by picking melodic rhythmic song fragments that weave together well. So in the beginning, the stark shift in text to the AK-47 line also provides contrast in vocal register, melodic contour, and rhythm. But when he returns to the AK-47 line near the end to cycle it into a groove, he proceeds it with a melodically similar phrase, albeit a lyric about wooing a girl. The AK-47 line adds some rhythmic variation, in particular throwing in some accentuation that gets dancers' bodies moving. So he seamlessly rolls into the riff, and then he sits on it, not for its content so much as for its sound. Through this, through this timing and, pa and pauses, he also provokes the dancers to interject exclamations, adding to the sonic texture. When repeated, until it becomes a musical cycle, creating a rhythmic groove, perhaps the reference to violence is only apprehended as a sonic component of the musical texture. Experiences of violence are present in the flow of things, embedded in the dance group. Politics and its bleed through into performance seeps into the texture of Ngoma sound. So this is the first time they're going to sing. to the opening phrase. And here it is where it becomes a groove, just from <laughs> So in a world in which dancers encounter violence, live and manage it, fear and suffer it, violence becomes a theme enunciated by the singing, dancing body. That violence, rendered into an aesthetic, has entwined injurious forms. Periodized through South Africa's history and enacted in the present, and here I'm talking about 1990 to 1994, experience of violence, experiences of violence are carried in bodies and voices. And so are positions reflecting upon it and the will to speak back to it or with it. So I treat Ngoma less as a genre to be culturally contextualized than as an embodied practice, crafted, subsumed through a lived history, enacted and naturalized as effective. Ngoma as an embodied practice that summarizes histories and keeps them alive in the present is inextricably linked to the history of violent politics and the politics of violent history. The question is, how does one actually articulate that link, and how does one do that ethnographically? Ethnomusicological analyses of music and violence hinge on the visceral experience that both music and violence evince. And I'm thinking of a number of different kinds of studies um, by ethnomusicologists. For example, um, uh, Matthew Samira, who um, 
has emphasized uh, in one of his pieces the kind of narrative circulation um, of the Iraq, of Iraq war violence through music videos. Or of someone like Joss Pilzer, who has uh, emphasized trauma and recuperation uh, in relationship to the Korean comfort war. Or Jessica Schweitz, whose uh, work has kind of emphasized memory and envision uh, in relation to the Marshall Islands as nuclear testing sites and um, singers from there. Or Jason McCoy, um, who has emphasized the role of music in relationship to propaganda and instrumentalization uh, in relationship to Simon McKinley and the Rwandan genocide. But I think all of these studies, as well as mine, work out from the fact, or I might say the phenomen phenomenological presumption, that violence, uh, violent experience and sound each similarly alter affect. And all of these studies also remark on uncertainty as a characteristic of the relationship between music and violence. Um, but place that kind of uncertainty in different places. Whether that, you know, whether that uncertainty is due to the kind of methodological limitations of studying music and violence, or to the po uh, semiotic polysemy, or to the sort of effusive but inarticulate aura of art, or to the unpredictability of the um, mediated reception of um, violence and music, or whether it's just also related to the skepticism over the veracity of people's narratives about violence. But in any which way, all of, all of these studies around music and violence seem to uh, come back and kind of circulate around these questions of uh, uncertainty in different kinds of ways. And so uncertainty here, in a way, is the object of my study. Um, it is the linchpin in the relationship between a forceful aesthetic and a finessed politics in the context of violence. So here, I'm following especially the work of David Samuels, uh, on, um, who's done work on country music on the um, Apache Reservation, and has made an argument and a, an ethnographic study of um, indexical ambiguity in music making, or indeterminacy. And um, he ties, he uses indexical ambiguity to tie sound to feeling and feeling to history. But important is, uh, he argues that saying that there's ambiguity in the indexical relations doesn't mean that this signifies a flirting. So I want to, I'm thinking with this idea of indexical in, uh, indeterminacy, um, indeterminacy in relationship to aesthetics. Um, uh, in a particularly violent context. And uh, uh, suggest that, in a way, aesthetics gathers an enormous force uh, precisely because of this relationship here. So, something about the force of aesthetics in, in relationship <coughs> to Ngun. Singing violent lyrics like, we are shooting Zulus, we are shooting, the, the Zulus are shooting, the Kosas are shooting, the Bata are shooting, shooting with an AK-47, AK um, singing these kind of violent, violent lyrics into a groove is completely in keeping with an Ngoma aesthetic. Um, and I say that because uh, Ngoma really celebrates a particular, it celebrates a military aesthetic in many ways. Uh, here are some examples. There are various forms of um, uh, dress that are um, tied up with soldiering, um, bits of security uniform that you can see here, um, as well as bits of Zulu warrior, but um, various bits of security uniform, including um, this here, wearing military satchels on one's back. There's an older version of it. Uh, and then there are also various uh, movements that are taken from military. So here, think of a drill sergeant and of saluting, as I show you Zabiwe in front of his team.
and he goes into singing. And in fact, the Baba dancers call themselves Amasosha, soldiers. So there are multiple factors that remind one that Ngoma is not real violence. Uh, for example, um, these, these dancers, a group of them use, uh, uh, their, their military satchels are uh, stuffed animals. Uh, they rave bags, bags bought um, in, the, in the market to go to rave clubs, and they fill them with candy, and at a particular moment they spray the candy out and the children go around after it. Uh, so there are multiple factors that remind one that Ngoma is not real violence. But Ngoma, by force of circumstance, is implicated in processes of violence. National politics waged violently during South Africa's transition years through mobile, noisy bodies. And Ngoma performance, expressing in motion and sound the experiences and perspectives of its practitioners, were at once intri intricately and loosely connected. So first, there is, they're stylistically connected, but Ngoma shares some stylistic features with Zulu political song uh, and rally dance marching. For example, here is an Inkata Freedom Party rally from 1992. Inkata Freedom, Inkata Freedom Party was the ethnic nationalist party, Zulu ethnic nationalist party. Here's Ngoma. There's an Encarta Freedom Party rally in 1992. And here's a Second, they're also connected by the premium that's placed on singing and dancing in Zulu public arenas. So rallies, in fact, uh, political rallies are almost all song and dance, or they have an enormous amount of song and dance in them. And then third, there are also um, some specific uh, performance frag fragments that cycle through both arenas. For instance, this one that I recorded at an Inkata rally um, is, I've also heard, performed uh, at recreational uh, fun events in rural Kazuli Natal, in which Ngoma is being performed. Here it is from the rally. to national politics through these loose but intricate connections embroils performers and struggles. To understand the way uh, and why uh, these performers get embroiled in these particular struggles, let me give you some background uh, to the uh, politics of the time. This is in the transition years, 1990 to 1994. So, the Nkata Freedom Party, as I say, a Zulu ethnic nationalist party, hadn't always been a violent player, nor a political party, nor a presence in the areas around Johannesburg where these men live and work. It was conceived during the early 1970s in the KwaZulu homeland as a cultural movement, not a political body. But it was puppeteered by the apartheid state into a deadly political program. The strategy was to generate a counterforce to the popular resistance aligned with the ANC um, uh, and South African Communist Party-led liberation movement. In the 1980s, Nkata's relationship with the state became increasingly formidable and structurally integrated, and its once amicable relationship with the ANC soured drastically. It turned to focus on regional consolidation and the production of Zulu political consensus engendering that consensus rhetorically, while also seeking it through physical threat. Over the course of the decade, the movement became inextricably and violently linked to state security organs. From these institutional ties that drew financial support, 
training, personnel and protection, while its members actively confronted the state's domestic opponents. So fueled by rhetoric and backed by the deadliest state institutions, Nkata-related violence escalated dramatically. In Natal, which is now KwaZulu-Natal, rural areas were aligned with the IFP. Urban areas were ANC strongholds. So there were conf confrontations, injuries, assassinations, arson, and rape um, uh, throughout the province, uh, to a point which, uh, at which um, um, observers called this area mayhem or civil war or wastelands. And then in the mid-1980s, the, the, the Natal Midlands um, was the most dramatic conflict region. But by 1990, the worst violence spread onto the, onto the Witwatersrand, uh, where Johannesburg is. And here, the township war, as it was termed, raged predominantly between the male hostels, which had become IFP strongholds by this time, and the informal settlements that had become ANC strongholds. And so eventually this violence spirit spread into the city centres of Johannesburg and Durban and Pietermaritzburg, the major uh, towns in the town. So the violence on the Witwatersrand was at its most drastic uh, from between 1991 and 1993. So the IFP became a voice to be reckoned with at the negotiation table in the run-up to the first democratic elections in 1994 while it also developed into a formidable state-sanctioned military force. So over 6 million Zulu-speaking South Africans were faced in the early 1990s with having to decide whether and how to align themselves politically. This meant refiguring their sense of self in relation to a very dramatically charged and mobilized Zuluness. Inkata by the early 1990s had made a claim on quintessential Zuluness, and so they championed its masculine icon, the warrior. In part a form of mediated violence itself, as a form of competitive um, um, uh, dancing, singing and dancing, that uh, plays with military aesthetics. So, in part a form of mediated violence itself, the Ngoma body and voice appears ready for instrumentalization in the service of violence in the streets and in the service of IFP ideologues who tried to utilize it. So for example, at a Johannesburg hostel in 1992, elders tried to coax Siazi Zulu to take up arms for Inkata. And they intimate, intimate that as the leader of a com community in Goma team, he could encourage the participation of his team as well. Or, IFP supporters in the hostels in another instance tried to mobilize Ngoma dancers working with Johnny Clegg, who leads an internationally successful band, Savuka. Mobilizing dancers, Amasosha, soldiers, borrows their acclaim. It bargains on their performative reputation as Amasosha, Ngoma soldiers, being converted into action as Izimpi, battalions of warriors, fighters for the nation. It also holds the promise of incorporating persuasive entertainers with stages, audiences, microphones, and megaphones. And here's a third example. The IFP uh, tried to reposition Siazi, uh, Siazi Zulu's professional dance group, the Umzanzi Zulu dancers, to perform at a rally, although they offered them no payment. So as these three examples show, uh, in the transition period, individuals living in struggle were implicated in, in Carter's claims, and hence they were embroiled in violence by circumstances, by their place in, in life, by their locality or their status as the leader of a dance team, by the force of their personality, by their talents as Ngoma dancers, and their endeavors. And they had to manage it. To do so, they exploited the looseness and intricacy of Ngoma's relation to violence. So, for example, when the elders coaxed Siazi to take up arms for Inkata, he of course refused. They had guns in the car, so he obliges by going to view the guns. He fires shots into the air. He makes jokes. He doesn't say he won't. Cave, he doesn't say he won't cave into the pressure. Or when the IFP requisition of Zanzi Zulu dancers to perform at that rally without offering any pay, payment, they say. 
but we are professionals. They had in fact recently returned from a French festival circuit. So they say, we are professionals, and they leave it at that. They don't play at the rally, but they never say they won't. And they just say, no politics, no politics in Angola. In fact, many Angola participants consider, them to, consider themselves to be apolitical or non-activist. And they staunchly reiterate that in Angola there are no politics. Angola, they say, is for the pleasure of everyone. And essentially, they don't want their art to be reduced to a political act. So lending Ngoma's grace to national politics embroils performers in struggles, but it also potentially heightens their performances' affect in non-political arenas. So in other words, in arenas that aren't directly tied to uh, party political programs. And it also circulates in Ngoma's resonating presence beyond its core constituency, so there are things to be gained. Yet violent outbreaks framed by performance may compromise in Goma's grace. These relationships between features of grace and forms of violence are neither direct nor inevitable. They're neither haphazard nor determined, even when they have real material effects. On the 6th of September 1992 in Johannesburg, TJ Lemon, a photojournalist, photo and I head out to a township where there's an IFP protest march in response to an ANC attack on an Nkata funeral of victims of ANC aggression in response to an Nkata attack. We're still in the city when we run into returning Nkata ralliers scurrying all over the road. They carry shields, spears, fighting dancing sticks and an array of sharpened implements. There are guns. There's commotion. 300 meters down the road, a white civilian raises his pistol at the ralliers. Positioned beside his idling truck, he isn't noticed much, except by his son. It's a long moment until the police come, and then they go again, as the ralliers rush back into their two minivans. The police don't follow them back to their hostel. We pass a soccer game as we follow the ralliers. TJ notes that this will be their next target. They charge the field and they charge the stands. Later we learned they killed people. They charge across the road to the trade store. A shopper is stabbed. Later we find an army man guarding the corpse. They frenzy back into their idling vehicles and head back to their hostel. At the hostel, women ululate in the courtyards. The band of men sing and dance. The circulation of style from body to body and voice to voice is not surprising in overlapping social networks. And you can see um, how dense uh, hostile dwelling can be. And it's not, that's not surprising in circumstances in which the political leadership exhorts its supporters to champion their tradition. But the shared style is not by performance strategic choice. Rather, similar versions appear because they feel right during the moment when performers deploy them. They appear in public through a sense of things in the moment, as a body-voice improvisation that organizes a sensual world. As Gavin Steinberg's Quieto music study shows, appearances through music are temporary, timed, and never fully transparent. Performance of violence turns to violence, and it then re-encapsulates the act as ordinary performance. While some forms drift from one practice to the other, so too might the spectre of violence. The mobility of violence coupled with the ambiguity of aesthetics makes for very opaque boundaries. On the one hand, a rampage ends in song and dance. The protest march is song and dance. Warrior performance co-occurs with IFP activism and sometimes proceeds and follows violent acts. On the other hand, Ngorma champions the warrior figure and plays with it. The mobility of violence is entangled with Ngorma's aesthetic amb ambiguity. First, because Ngorma's relationship to the past and to violent political agendas uh, for which it uh, is sometimes mobilized is indeterminate. And second, because violence has the capacity to appear 
never fully transparent, disappear, reappear in a gong. In this way, performance can transport violence. As violence spilled out into the city streets, it captured the attention of the news media, to whom performances of warriorship offered spectacular images and sound clips. For example, confirming the stereotypical image of the Zulu warrior by sensationally dwelling on Zulu men in traditional dress at political rallies or in the course of vigilante activities, as Levine has written. As they also utilized the sound of singing and dancing that dominated rallies and marches. Violence, in the dominant form of its global mediation, raised the stakes on Ngoma. The representation of warrior violence is sensationalized in the course of its mediation subsequently returning in sensationalized form to those it represents. So, at home, signs of the experience or the threat of rail violence appear through the feel of things. The shooting of an AK-47 as a sun riff that repeated becomes a lilting groove that prepares men to dance. It's a sound, the Zabiwe's rippling counterpoint that spurs men to move their bodies to the beat, together. They have fun. It's a body-centered pleasure in terms that Ngoma defines. It's a provocation to dance. In other words, Ngoma makes this ravaging violence into ordinary musical material. And this material is also circulated on cassettes and CDs, although I'm not going to talk about that here. But here, for example, is a, um, one uh, song with about violence and this is how it sounds on the song. Multiple intersecting forms. 
fighting his culture, says Siazi Zulu, a lead, one of the leaders of the team. And he's arguing on historical grounds, not on ontological grounds. He runs through the dates, 1944, 57, 1960, 1980s, all the way through to 1993, 1996, and so forth. <coughs> and further, these dates follow a very long history, periodized history, that is, of violent colonial politics that included the Anglo-Zulu Wars and much more. <coughs> so in addition to the long and short political his histories undergirding mobile violences of the present, Ngoma as a pugilistic aesthetic and a competitive social practice reiterates that fighting is culture. And Ngoma has its own history. It is, um, it's been implicated in surges of ethnic hostility and um, in resistance to apartheid state's labor practices since the early 20th century in different ways. So they've been in the 1920s and again in the 1930s, as Veit Ullman and others have written, um, <coughs> attempts by um, uh, the mines or by the state or by municipal officials in some ways to kind of domestic, uh, domesticate Ngoma or ban Ngoma or control it in different kinds of ways. Um, so. And in addition to that, <coughs> Um, local factional vendettas, which themselves have inter intersecting um, histories with national struggles, uh, were, were entangled with inter-district Ngoma fighting. So, local struggles uh, uh, sort of cycle through Ngoma dancing as well. And I'm just going to give you uh, one example, a complicated example, that I'm going to give you the short version of. Uh, two, t two teams on either side of a river um, always dance together. They have friends on both sides of the river in both these communities. Um, and then a factional, when a a factional fight arose, which was tied up with taxi wars and all sorts of other things. These um, violences, are, these factional vendettas are never simple. Um, and they, so then they didn't dance together for 10 years. And um, then, uh, after much negotiation, they came together and had, and had a dance. And the moment I'm going to show you is the key kind of moment uh, in this dance, where <coughs> the team, where an alleged accomplice uh, in the assassination of um, a key dancer from a team A, uh, steps out to dance for the first time. So team B's um, dancer steps, Team B's dancer steps out to dance, and nothing is spoken, but everybody uh, knows that he was uh, allegedly an accomplice um, in the assassination of one of Team A's prize dancers. And so uh, it's a very dramatic moment uh, in which T, one of Team A's best dancers, in fact, the captain of the team, steps out to compete with him. So um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the sequence. Nothing is spoken. Nothing happens, but this is a moment of kind of a reintegration of this dancer, and, but a reintegration without forgetting the history here. Um, there's much commotion. Uh, the commotion is looks chaotic, but it's actually pretty organized. Um, and these are all dancers who are dramatizing the moment and wanting to participate. Thank you for a very rich talk, ethnographically rich and conceptually rich too. And I, I wanted to ask you in particular about um, two concepts that were sort of axes that this was moving around art and violence or aesthetics and violence. Um, so it was very striking the distinction made between the, the sticks of the Europeans and the sticks of our ancestors here, which seemed to map onto two different kinds of uh, military ethos, right, or two ethical worlds. One, we're you know, shooting innocents with guns at a distance. One, uh, where it's warrior versus warrior. That there's, um, we saw the various kinds of uh, formalized performance there. So it's, it seems like violence um, conflates these two, or erases that distinction between these two ethical worlds. Um, and I, I wonder if that's part of, in fact, the, the representational violence you were describing, uh, the, the mediated violence in depicting Zulu warriors this way, and depicting the African body as fierce, as illogical, etc. So, um, so I'm wondering, first of all, about the, the work, the analytic work 
that violence does here in conflating those two. And then secondly, a similar kind of move, the, the scene that you sketched when the Ngoma dancers were uh, saying, oh, sorry, we can't, we can't serve at your rally because we're artists, right? Ngoma is art, so therefore it's not political. So an, another way of bowing out of d choosing sides or, you know, are you with the, the ANC or the IMF, or sorry, the IFP, IFP excuse yeah, me. Yeah. It shows how little I know about South Africa, so please correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. Um, so those seem in some ways like parallel discursive moves, and I'm wondering if that's part of what prompted you to put, you know, rely so heavily conceptually on aesthetics and violence as organizing themes and making sense of this ethnographically as you were writing this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think um, partly I, I relied so heavily on violence because it's so uh, it, it's so um, present, and it's so present also in the, um, the way um, it's present in, multi in, in, in multiple forms, basically, um, including the kind of you know, the, the dramatic artistry that, that, that it produces. Um, but I think um, thank you for that um, idea of. That uh, the, the actual violence is conflating these, these different kinds of ethical models. Um, I think that's an interesting way to think of it. Um, it's also that those, it, it's not only in Gorma that does that, but that um, the whole sort of history, of, both of performance and the whole history of the, the way I think that a lot of Zulu, um, uh, popular Zulu history is narrated mm -hmm. precisely by um, conflating that, those two models. So, um, that could be, be really useful to think, to think of it, actually. So, I mean, I think the, the, the important thing also is not to make the, the one world in a, in a way more ethical than the other, mm -hmm. um, but rather to look at the way the conflation of these two worlds ups, you know, ups the violence, essentially, right? and closes down the possibilities for Zulu performers or for, for Zulu um, men who are living in increasingly um, difficult times. So. Uh, presumably there's ethical codes governing gun violence as well, um, even though you know, that wasn't part of what you're working on here. Uh, yeah. yeah, and um, <clears throat> but uh, this, this particular area too, uh, in Singa, the area that they are from, is also an area in which, um, which is notorious for its uh, um, for its weaponry, including, in, including for the um, construction of its own weaponry. Mm -hmm. um, and so that there's also is a way in which there's a lot of um, bravado that's also tied in with um, uh, ownership and usage of guns. So that's a very good mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Thank you for, for your paper. I, I really love this idea of the mobility of violence and, and the ambiguity of aesthetics. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the connection between aesthetics and kinesthetics here, and and violence, and, and this idea that part of the aesthetics is preparing strong bodies, preparing warrior bodies. And, and, you know, this is this is similar to capoeira or Haitian rara or other kinds of very uh, you know you said it, pugilistic aesthetics, and I love that that idea as well. But to what extent is the aesthetic also about creating a specifically hardened, toned, fighting body. And if you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. So um, <clears throat> I'm sure that for a lot of you, the kind of resonance, resonances with capoeira um, uh, sort of come to mind. And the capoeira uh, literature has been, I find, very useful to kind of think through, like, how are um, people writing about capoeira dealing with this relationship between the, the ring and the street? Um, and um, <clears throat> and with the ambig ambiguity there between the idea of capoeira as game, fight, or play. So Katja Wesolowski, for instance, has uh, written about how in capoeira that that, that very ambiguity uh, has, is part of what has enabled capoeira's uh, globalization. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a similar kind of uh, ambiguity that I'm thinking of here, but taking it in, in a <clears throat> different direction towards um, the violent. And so uh, the idea of a kind of pugilistic um, aesthetic, um, uh, I take also from Loic Vakant, who talks about pugilistic um, 
vocations. Okay. So, uh, uh, in, you can think of Ngoma here alongside not only Capoeira but uh, other um, competitive, uh, other sports or martial arts that deal with a kind of competitive camaraderie. So, the boxing ring, the wrestling, wrestling ring, um, Capoeira, etc. So, um, and I think in all of these, in all of these cases, it is part of um, how you cultivate um, through aesthetics, how you cultivate um, uh, a body that is prepared, a body and a voice that is prepared, um, and that is certainly part of the um, uh, ethical schooling in Angoma as well. So, for instance, if I just uh, take the voice. Like the voice and the dancing, part of the idea here is that you push yourself to the edge. So the lead singer, someone like Zabiwa, whose voice rings out. I mean, he 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 sings in um, at the top of his modal register, and often in exactly the same kind of spot. And it's not an easy place to sing. Right? He doesn't he doesn't shift over into his head register. He sings. He belts basically, um, and um, in in acoustically really diff difficult. Uh, a difficult environment, right? So you, he really has to project his voice, and so part of uh, the aesthetics there, as I understand them, is to push yourself to an edge, and at that and ride that edge in a really eloquent way. So that um, part of the training is to be able to do that with the utmost of control. That's part of the, I think the the control also the kind of martial martial arts control, right? and so you can think of it in terms of the voice. But also in terms of the dancing. So as you saw with these dance sequences, you basically, um, in one sequence, you have to. Uh, the, the the key part of, of each sequence is that high kick, your final kick, and everything else is kind of improv that prepares you for that, um, because you have to kick as high as you can and as hard as you can, and then you stamp and you notice how often they fall over afterwards. That's about. You kick as hard as you can, and then you then you perform that you've expended all your energy by falling over backwards, right? Which itself is an artful display. And um, then you're dancing against somebody else, so you're pushing them to outperform themselves. And um, so there are all these ways in which you're pushing each other to be in utmost control um, at your edge, which I think is part of the, the kind of martial training of the body is for getting there. Yeah. Um, I have a question that I, I think is in like, kind of a way follow up to the previous question, but kind of take a um, historical perspective onto that question. I mean, the, 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 the idea of a separate aesthetic realm, just like the idea of professionals and professionalization, is in, in Europe, it's, it's, it's an 18th century. Development. It's 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 you know it's it's relatively new <laughs> in, the, in the sort of uh, frame of mind of the historian. And so I'm wondering about the history of the Borma, and, and because it's sort of your examples um, for people practicing it today, it is very important to articulate a separation, a difference through a vocabulary of, of professionalization and through a vocabulary of art yeah. form. Yeah. Um, is, is, but when has this need set in? And why has this need set in and has become such a key part of the culture of, of this art, this practice, let's call it this way, because you know, I'm already yeah. yeah, that also builds nicely on the idea of, um, of a, you know, the conflation of these two sort of eth different um, ethical systems. In that the, the dancers themselves imagine uh, um, uh, narrate a long history to Ngoma, which is a history that goes back to uh, Zulu right? But that's uh, that the way that dancers prepare for battle. Right? Um, and that's a good thing. Um, But the most, you know, the act, the, the, the more specific history is one uh, um, that grows out of violence, that is the violence of migrant labor. 
where um, this dance, uh, this, this song and dance form kind of, uh, and the song, song and dance practice evolved um, with men going to the cities and as a recreational form. Mm -hmm. And so it became something specific in, in the context of island micro labor. And that's 20th century. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so 20 and then later, later so 1920s on really. Um, so, um, but why would they sort of constantly want to make a, a, a separation? Um, and I think that's, a, that's also a really important part of it too, and difficult to kind of tease out. Um, but I think, it, I think there are multiple components to it. One, they want to be artists, um, because, and, they, and they want the breaks that artists get. They want to participate in a, in a global, global world. They, you know, they want to tour, they want to make CDs. Um, but also, you know, they they um, don't want to be thought of as belligerent and bellicose, um, uh, and they don't want to be associated with uh, performances that are um, that are that are radical and um, that actually produce violence. So. Um, so, you know, how do you eloquently, how do they as artists eloquently both um, use the warrior as a tradable commodity for themselves, um, celebrate something that they feel is a deep um, uh, culture which has now become a cultural heritage um, and so a tradable commodity, and um, how do they, so how do they celebrate that and yet separate it from the, from its associations with um, violent forms of ethnic nationalism, <laughs> I think that's the, those, and I think all different, different it happens differently in different instances. So, thank you. Yeah. I had a question about one of your opening questions about the the violent lyrics in relationship to a groove and what happens, and I was wondering if you would uh, go back to that question. Um, because I kept thinking about uh, modes of signification in terms of what it's like for us to sit here and read the lyrics and then we see these words and the experience is one of this sort of like, ah, uh, you know, there's this sort of, um, you know, a dissonance there. Uh, and I wonder what model of signification you would ascribe within the Ngoma in terms of how lyrics and groove and then the visual register of the dance interact, whether or not you see consonants between them or if you see them operating in contradictory registers at all. If, um, to my unaffiliated, you know, quote, westernized ear, to sort of experience this as a dissonance, and then to wonder, like, okay, well, um, so many relationships between music and violence in a lot of Western pop music is about fantasy, um, and about these personas are there, and in many ways, to fulfill fantasies of listeners. And uh, the way you presented this is in a dialectic with national politics and violence, and the ways in which these subjects are implicated within more or less localized struggles, um, and that it's a kind of more balanced dialectic, and it's not part of this kind of larger question of fantasy and mass culture. Yeah. But, I mean, in, in any sense, I feel like there's probably, at some register, an intermedial question about the sound of the groove and the lyrics and the visual register potentially operating in counterpoint, and I just wonder if what kind of signification you think might be at work. Yeah. Um, so how would you take that action moment? work out the ethnography, the, the, the multiple levels of signification of the other, the various components of the performance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be, uh, let's see if I could do that right on, on the spot or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, because I think there are moments, um, I think there are moments when they cohere and other moments when just like uh, all artists can register the irony of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, In this, but in this particular moment, where he's singing, well, you know, in the, the singing the, the uh, my sense, my sense of that particular moment 
is that the, that there in fact isn't really a dissonance between uh, the semiotics of the of the text, so the poetics of the text, and of the and um, uh, of how it becomes a group. That there's something completely coherent about it at, at that moment, mm -hmm. which enables it to be just kind of apprehended, possibly, um, as uh, as a sonic moment. And um, that, that there isn't a dissonance, I don't think, at that particular mo at a moment like that, precisely because it's embedded in this larger military, as, you know, military aesthetic. Um, uh, so that it is, so that it's made completely coherent by the larger military military aesthetic, but there are other moments, in fact, in, in from the same afternoon that I recorded that performance, where um, one of the other leaders was um, singing, uh, and um, much more explicitly brought in um, uh, national politics um, by naming. Um, and by, by addressing Dacia Butelezi, the leader of the IFP party, and warning him about the violence that was going to happen. And in those kind of things, I you know, generally didn't hear in, in Gorma. This was just on a you know, happy, happy afternoon. So there are moments where I think uh, leaders will, will create the dissonance um, by heightening, say, heightening the lyrics or the content of the lyrics or something like that. Um, but this one, th that particular moment feels particularly coherent for me. Right. Um, and perhaps that's why it can be um, so, so, mm. so much about the sense of it. Yeah, maybe some of it is just listening to the sound recording with the lyrics, having that sort of separated out without any visual image, as opposed to watching the dance visual in the second clip, the you know, last clip that you played, where the all, all three elements are kind of presented at once. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, in a way, following up on Mike's question, that the, the particular references of AK-47s, I was just wondering um, about, um, you know, does it have more specific valences in that context? Um, and I was thinking of the Umshini Wang um, song that became known at least here because of Jacob Zuma singing it to stave off. Uh, a scandal that he, you know, was dealing with, but uh, <laughs> but um, but that uh, you know that's a machine gun in a particular ANC context, and, that, and I know so little about this particular world, so I'm just really curious as to specific words, specific guns versus ge general guns, you know, and um, and in part inspired by uh, in our seminar we just read uh, Martin Daughtry's really excellent book on listening to Iraq, and he points out that. Um, Iraqi insurgents have Kalashnikovs, but um, but uh, the Iraqi trained uh, army has U.S. machine guns. So of course these have different sounds and of course different meanings. And so I was just curious if these I don't know if there's more to be said than it's just an AK-47. Therefore it's a violent you know it's a gun. It's a figure of violence. So that, that maybe there isn't, but I'm wondering about that. Yeah, um, thank you. I think there's I mean there's a there's a there's a much bigger history here around uh, the enormous uh, amount of gun use in, in South Africa and um, uh, on the one hand some of the sort of local forms of weaponry, um, the legal and the uh, the legal and the unlegal arms trade, etc. etc. Most of which of course in, in this area um, amongst the people that we came with is an illegal trade. Um, and uh, that uh, the all these you know there, there's an enormous attention to a, a lot of knowledge about different forms of, of weaponry too, um, amongst men and, and young boys. And the AK, I, I haven't asked them specifically in this in this context, but you're absolutely right that the AK-47 was very much associated with the ANC, um, as opposed to um, the uh, Encarta Freedom Party. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't used uh, sure. across the board. So, so there could well be other resonances there, which are uh, in this particular lyric of when they're talking about Zulus are shooting with an AK-14. Um, it could be the idea there of Zulus aligned with the ANC. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about, because you, uh, this, uh, this the issue of masculinity and this warrior character um, that they are evoking. Um, the, you've 
presented it as this competition, sort of ritualized competition between men. But then, um, in your first set of examples, uh, there was, I mean, they were singing to, or there were, the songs include women in them. And so, um, I always find sort of ritualized displays of the body um, between men to be such an, a, an interesting dynamic, especially when there are these sort of expressions of, of masculinity or sort of even a sort of almost pedagogical method of sort of, of uh, reproducing or, or sort of educating community members in their culture and etc. So um, all these clips were pretty much all men. So is that the primary audience? If there are other audiences that include women and children, does that change the dynamic of the performance? Does that, is there, uh, is there more of a sort of, you know, gendered element or a sexualized element that ever comes into this? Um, it, it, yeah, thank you for that. For, um, you will notice that I um, that was that I've very much focused on um, men here. It is a, ma a, a male um, form of artistry. Women don't dance in Gorma, but they do dance. Uh, uh, they are women's dance forms. Um, but having said that, that doesn't mean to say that even though in Gorma is a male form that is not constituted and uh, uh, in style. Um, only in relationship to among men, but also in relationship to women, um, girls, children, etc. So um, I haven't focused on, on the women's roles here, but the women, of course, do play roles around and um, in Gorma crucial roles as well. So, and what I've also I've focused on one particular register of masculinity here, uh, and one particular profile, and that is around the kind of martial. Uh, register of, mas of Zulu masculinity through Ngorma, but of course there are other ones as well. Um, and you um, bring up another excuse me, um, absolutely crucial one, and that is the way that Ngorma plays um, a role in um, uh, uh, flirtation and courting practices. So, I mean, these are the cool dudes, if ever they do dudes who are cool uh, in a rural KwaZulu Natal who dances. And um, Ngorma, in fact, is a site for a lot of um, courting and flirtation. And women um, mark their relationships to men as they dance. So if somebody comes out and does a really fabulous dance, um, that person's mother or mothers and, or and sisters might sort of run out into the dance arena, do a little dance and illuminate. Mm -hmm. And girls bring um, gifts um, to, um, to the dancers and tie them around them. Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of ways in which women are involved. And so, hence so also the, the lyrics that you notice. So the lyrics that Zabima started off were about girls. Um, and so there's another whole register around here that is about relationships uh, to women as well as um, local practices around um, marriage and courting and domestic life. Um, and so it's, uh, and a crucial part of that is also about sweetness, not only about this kind of art. I hate to cut off a good discussion, but I think uh, it's getting dark out a lot earlier these days, and people may uh, need to head home. But let's thank Professor Dean for